works now. So in the thousand, this is probably something that, that uh, you know, uh, and it was yeah, inspiring for me because I, I started my research on computer science, soil study analysis, uh, it's about software verification. So when you need to write an algorithm that should work in, in condition, for instance, if you are writing the software for an you know, airplane and have to run and testing is not enough, there is this methodology uh, that works uh, somewhere into a mathematical abstraction where you can then improve the audience. So uh, I was doing that mostly for why applications in the beginning working in France uh, in a research group that uh, is specialized in model chain. But at some point, I started working with adaptive for, uh, traffic light systems uh, for a project, a research project in Buenos Aires. So, what is the connection? So, traffic light systems are uh, things, say, machines in some way. So, their systems and interact uh, with different states. Uh, we wanted to be sure that in all these connections between the traffic lights, uh, there were no, no green green states, intersections that we, of course, cause crashes and, and accidents. So I started working on that, and that was like my connection between the theoretical computer science and the, and the cities. Um, then uh, I went to UC Berkeley to the PhD plan to complement my formation in of science. Uh, and, uh, and at that point, uh, city again was, was something very, very present uh, because the, the professor that I met to work in planning is a brilliant professor that is called Volwell that created uh, something. I mean, that what, what at that point was closer to SimCity in reality. That's the model that is called Urban City, that is an open source model for visual planning that has been developed since the 90s. Uh, and and then we started working in, in different projects. I, I will show you our, our first work. Uh, that uh, I mean, when we started working with Open C, we wanted to do uh, visualizations, but uh, at that point uh, we didn't focus on the digital environment. So we focused more on on, on creating new cities from scratch. So we created this prototype uh, with Carlos Juanegas, uh, another friend and uh, very good uh, researcher, that uh, allowed us to experiment with play styles. Uh, at that point, play style was like a, a new concept. Uh, for, for the ones of, of you that doesn't know them, they are I mean, uh, different typologies uh, among cities, like uh, you know, a residential part of the city, a downtown part of the city, and this software, what we had, we allowed was to edit them in place and, and in some way configure the layout of the city uh, for agility development as you know uh, we were creating them. So if you create a couple of uh, place types in this, uh, this tool, you can configure setbacks, uh, types, the new types, and uh, even the, the roads, the, the kind of Pros that uh, you want to use, and what is interesting from the this is procedural technology, so that means that it's uh, geometry that is being created as you edit, so it is computed as, as you are editing, and you can also uh, compute some analytics as you are creating the city. This was used in, in India for a couple of projects, uh, in, this was 2010, so I understand the, the technology and the visualizations are in part to what was possible. Uh, at, at that point, but again, uh, in SimCity you start from scratch and you, you know, like build a city from nothing and you try to create value for the city, to, for the population to, to move, but that, that is not the way that cities, you know, uh, evolve in, in reality. Uh, it's only more cities, you have historical reasons, you have the, 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 the prices that you have, the feelings that you have. Oh, oh, you can come. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think the online audience has some, okay. having some difficulties. Yeah. Also, switch the mic. Yeah, you can also use the laptop. Okay, so you can try that. Yes. Okay. Let's try that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, 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 okay. I move to the mic. Yeah, or just for a moment. I think the mic. There is a mic. There is a mic. Just try to do it. So, again, there are historical reasons why the cities are relatively in multiple places. There is something that happened to us many, many times. Is that is that we created algorithms for cities, and we tested that you know a couple of parcels, like you know hundred parcels, a thousand parcels, and it worked well. But then when we went to real cities, they were very strange shapes in the city. Uh, nothing is rectangle or nothing is uh, you know complex polygon. There are many examples that we break any of the. Any, any of the other things that, that we believe. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to begin, sorry. Uh, I think the mic is still there, so probably I'm still not lost. Okay, I should keep it here. So, so we started working uh, with real, uh, real data, so the real environment. So let, let's, see an, let's see an example here. Okay. Uh, this is uh, New Orleans in the, in the US, and this is the old French, uh, the, the fort, from the, the old town from the French uh, uh, era. So you can see there that there is a the river and there are you know, walls in the city. What, what is interesting is that the actual plan of the city, even nowadays, uh, had you know, traded of that part. And, and you can see there that the parts are uh, shaped beginning to around the walls of the city that come in there like three centuries ago. So the, the, the real environment is super important. So even uh, this visualization needs that we have. At that point, uh, we probably work on procedural technology to create paintings uh, and technology departments. So basically, you are, what we are seeing on the left uh, is taking the visual frame of a different building or even the parcels like the pet parts. Again, the bit environment. So we have to add to what is built. So you can see here uh, procedural buildings that uh, we worked a lot on around 2012. Um, also, parcel subdivision. So getting a real block for a city or adapting the, the block of the city, uh, creating parcels that make sense and creating buildings on top of that. Uh, that, that was, um, I mean, a work that we use for visualizing results of our simulations uh, and the, the, the work that we were doing at, at UC Berkeley. And, and there was also another path in, in this uh, work that uh, was being developed at ETH Zurich by Pascal Müller and others. And then they created Procedural, that was a company uh, that worked specifically in Procedural Geometry that finally ended up being part of the of some Pixar movies. I mean, all the city that is represented in the background that was created uh, Procedural as a procedural city uh, by by this software. So that said, 2012, um, the city of San Francisco, the, the Bay Area in general, uh, hired us uh, from, from the university to create uh, a simulation that will be used to create a new plan for the Bay Area. The, the Bay Area is, is a, I mean, an area of California around San Francisco, Oakland, uh, and they wanted to create a 20-year plan for the for the region. They had five different uh, simulation criteria or so different priorities like public transportation, green space. Uh, I mean, different priorities. So we simulated with Urban Sim the five different scenarios. And um, the problem was again visualization: how, how to transmit uh, or how to generate community engagement for uh, a tool that was mostly based on numbers, text, and that kind of thing. So we created this platform that is called Urban Vision, and that was uh, 2012 with the collaboration with the 
Purdue uh, University. And we were able to, to you know, uh, with the technology that was available at that time, it was a desktop C++ application uh, to compare scenarios to see how the city, you know, will uh, will will evolve <laughs> in one of these scenarios and the other. And it was also a super interesting experience because we toured around all the Bay Area and, and talked to people and see how they reacted, you know, to to these uh, visualizations. So given that interest uh, with uh, Paul Waddell, Carlos Vanegas, Fletcher Fotai, Eddie Chanowitz, all colleagues from, from UC Berkeley, we decided to create a startup because we saw that there was like a niche on, on the, not only urban visualization, but also connecting these land use models to, uh, to, to visualizations and, and make that available to cities. So we founded Citicity. Uh, uh, that was uh, our first startup in in 2012. Uh, the the first uh, again the, the first challenge was to be able to create uh, inputs for the model and visualize outputs. Um, we are talking about regional model models. So, for instance, in the Bay Area, it, it was uh, I think two million parcels, seven million people. So it was a lot of data involved. Um, Again, the, the GIS at that point uh, was using the 2D canvas to draw. So it was like a very old technology. Um, we had some experience with uh, OpenGL from the procedural geometry. So we started using more like game technology that was being used for, for the yeah, important games of, of the area uh, for GIS. So that, that was, I think, our one, one of our main uh, innovations. So we create that platform, uh, Urban Canvas. You can see here a, a video. Um, you, you can see that we are visualizing a lot of information. That, that was our goal. Um, the thing is that when you are panning, it's it's slow, but it's it's usually pans. Uh, the, the there is like a background process that is generating all the procedural geometry in the background. In this case, it's a schematic just to show an indicator, but now you can see also procedural modeling. So these are, are not real 3D models, they are not being generated by, by humans. It's just taking building footprints, taking the height, and take, uh, taking into account the, the, the building type and generating them. And in a way that you can, for instance, put a brush, you can modify the the, the, the type of, of the of the building area. And everything was like real time. So it was a very interesting visualization technology. Um, I always say that that, that is, it was you know good and bad for the simulation work that we were doing because Autodesk came and acquired the company uh, because they, they liked to, to integrate the visualization technology into their products. Uh, but for the work that we were doing with cities, planners making the software available to, to cities, uh, it was a kind of stop in, in, in our journey. So we spent around one and a half year in Autodesk. And then we decided to spoon out again with Paul Waddell, the professor that is the, the author of Urban Sim, and Eddie Shanowitz. Um, we focus uh, at this point uh, with a couple of changes. Uh, we moved the simulation stack to the cloud because again, it was 2016, Google Cloud and AWS was starting. so. We had the simulations that had a very long runtime, so we containerized them and we moved them to the cloud and started doing some visualization platform to, to be able to run them on the cloud. And, and also introduced the web technology for the front end because uh, WebGL was just starting. Uh, there were a lot of 2D maps, uh, like open layers and all those technologies, but the, the 3D maps for the web were, were just starting. So. We did that, um, we focused a lot on adoption. So we installed this software, Urban Sim, in more than 50 cities in the US or regions in, in general, because we work with cities, uh, MPOs that are the regional planning agencies in the US, and also public agencies. We went to Canada, we did a couple of projects in Australia, and then we went to Colombia and South Africa, that were the first implementations that we did with the company of this of this model, and that that was uh, an important point because the the results of the model were not very good in those contexts. Uh, because, for instance, in South Africa, we work with the formal city, 
and, and of course uh, models simulation models in the US are, are not uh, it's not something that is taken into account they, they, they we started to find some limitations uh, with, with the implementation I, I mean it, it was a very interesting learning project six year uh, learning projects and the company is still operating I'm still a partner of the company I am uh, now working at Urbanly my first startup but uh, the company still exists and, and is providing solutions to, to to cities in the US but we find a, a couple of important limitations one was data uh, because all the information that Urban Scene requires uh, I mean it, it, it's a lot and requires usually a consulting con contract for you know four to six, six months uh, so that's it's a very big barrier of adoption for smaller cities for big cities perhaps it's not a problem because we help them to organize their information and, and that added value but for smaller cities uh, it's a problem and the problem with data and, and urban theme is that the, the granularity level is like even when you are working with a very big region it's not taking into account that perhaps there are parts of the city that are more, more livable and there are a lot going on and there are some suburban parts that there, there is not a lot of uh, activity there so uh, i thought that we can be you know smarter on on the on the data then uh, as i told you the difficulties of adapting to non non us uh, planning realities that was uh, really evident in in colombia and, and south africa urban c has also limited sensitivity to granular changes for instance something that was very interesting to me were I know, uh, the, the, the connection of public transportation and land use. And for instance, uh, in, in urban scene, there is some, I mean, uh, there's some uh, accessibility calculations going on for location choice models and, and all that, but it, it's not like you will add a new stop of a transit line and, you know, you, you will get like, sensible differences in the in the simulated future so we wanted to work much much more on that um and then there are some we don't have much time now but there are some constraints in the pricing models uh, and, and also allocation algorithms so taking into account all those <laughs> limitations one and a half year ago i started urbanly with a couple of colleagues uh, from you know my career in, in the different startups and I would say that my first obsession was data and how to, you know, get, uh, get data faster to remove that barrier from, from the cities. So we started using more open data sources like OpenStreetMap and GDF feeds for transportation. We started doing a lot of web scrapping uh, because I always say that the data uh, never doesn't exist. The data is there. It's just that you have to, you know, gather that, that in some way. I, I mean, the buildings are there, the trees are there, but it's just the way that you can, you know, gather them. Um, and we end up doing a lot of web scrapping. Now we are working in Rio de Janeiro in a place that there is no information, for instance, about transportation, bus lines, and we have to go to the web and get the addresses of the stops of the bus lines, geocode that go to a vectorizing process and you know create the bus lines and then use that for accessibility it's a you know very very long process but it's the way it is we are also utilizing some uh, detection on aerial images satellite images i will show an, an example soon um still we are relying a lot of, of uh, on humans doing uh, digitalization for instance the zoning constraints is something that in every part of the world that I think worked on, uh, it's still code in, I mean, law in, in PDFs. So you have to read the code, understand the law and digitalize that. And of course there are no standards across the different parts of the world. So it's not like the, you know, the attributes of the codes are, are always the same, like setbacks, maximum heights. No, they, they are different. And, and, and there are some codes that are super difficult in terms of like, computational description in the sense that perhaps the, the, the maximum height of a building depends on what is built in the opposite, uh, uh, you know, sidewalk, uh, the, the opposite street. But the good news uh, in Rurali is that we were working with this six months period in the previous startup. We went to a month when we started with Rurali and we are more or less now in, in one week. 
in the US, we can be a bit faster because we have a lot of APIs. Uh, in Europe, it depends on the country. And in other countries, of course, sometimes it, it, takes, uh, it takes longer. But we are more or less in, in, in those uh, times. Um, I want to show you something that we did uh, with AI and, and satellite detection. Uh, this uses meta segment anything that is a, a new segmentation model that uh, you know Meta Facebook did uh, release three months ago. But we not only uh, did the you know take advantage of the segmentation to segment things, but also we added a semantic layer on top of that. So as you can see in the video, you can you know, say cars, trees, or buildings, and, you know, it will first segment everything and then recognize, for instance, what is a car, what is a tree, or, you know, different things that you want to recognize. So these tools are, of course, super useful, uh, are important to have, uh, help a lot, but of course, are, are always part of the process, a data process that can start with AI, but in the end, it will, require at least some of, of uh, human intervention. And it's the way it is, and, and uh, we are just, just doing that. So let's talk more about the model now uh, and what we are trying to do differently uh, in Urbanly compared to, to, to the other models. I, I always like this screenshot. Uh, this is SimCity 2000, and this is uh, what the group tried to do to like to unveil the, the black box that is behind SimCity also. Because, uh, you know, as, as any game, uh, if you realize how, how are the, the mechanics that are, you know, besides the, the game, you can beat it because you can understand what is the best way to build a city uh, to, to beat the game. Uh, and there was a group that uh, did that a few years ago and, you know, trying like to take this and as an optimization problem. So how can we, you know, include more and more population with less services? And, and you know, you, you can see example in the internet, but what they get is, is horrible because uh, they discover that schools and health centers are not very important for the black box that is behind SimCity, at least uh, SimCity 2000. And, and they generate this, you know, uh, horrible city uh, that, that, I mean, it, it's, not very good. So it was interesting that Maxis at that point, the creators of SimCity, uh, did a product called SimHealth. Uh, because at some point they started doing like professional simulations uh, to train people and, uh, and all that after doing SimCity. And this SimHealth is not very known, but what, what is interesting is that they got to the point that you were able to modify the black box. I mean, modify the model that was behind the game. And I, I think it's, you know, it is uh, like an example of the extreme of this of these uh, software toys, as we write uh, call them. Uh, how far you can go, you know, uh, trying to, to to mimic this kind of thing in games. Of course, games are games, and, and we are trying to do something very different. But I I, I want to motivate the, the model discussion about that. So something that is very important to understand about these kind of models is that. Prediction and simulation are very similar things, but uh, you you need to to have uh, the difference is very very clear. So in prediction you, you are aiming for accuracy, and in simulation you are trying to compare the sensitivity of the input, you know, of, of an output, and find a way to create like a mental model to understand how the dynamics and the phenomena work. So. I, I will say that at least for the current technology, prediction is impossible because it's predicting the future. And I think it's at least it's very difficult to predict the future. So the best what we can do is to do simulations. And simulations is trying to, again, uh, understand the sensitivity of the inputs, understand what are the dynamics uh, behind the process. And with that information, uh, you know, using these software tools that helps you to do a lot of calculations that needs to be done for a, for a simulation. Uh, understand, uh, yeah, what will be the best choice in terms of, of that simulation and, and those processes. Um, I think there are very fundamental questions in, in the simulation models. 
that are what is the use of the simulation. The first thing is that we do at Urbanly when we go to a city is what is the question that you want to answer with the simulation. And those questions are very different. And there are some, sometimes we can answer them with the models that we have. Sometimes we have to write new models or sometimes we say, no, no it's impossible with the knowledge that we have to, to solve that. And, and of course, ready to that is what kind of decision uh, you, you want to to. Given that, you know, uh, leaders make to me decisions and, and they have high stakes, they have uncertain conditions, uh, simulating impacts, uh, you know, can, can be, can make a, a very big difference in time compared to, you know, predicting the future. And also something that is super interesting is when you use models to share knowledge. So it's, you know, a, a tool that you can use uh, to to like to try different points of view, different perspectives, and understand you know how, how they relate to try to get to a common co conclusion uh, in some way. So you know, with these comments, what I'm I'm trying to to differentiate here is like the oraculous uh, version of this kind of models, where you think that you can like press a button and you see uh, a, a kind of depiction of the future. I don't believe uh, on, on that kind of uh, models. I, I think that models against are tools that support uh, human processes. Planning is a human process. A city is nothing more human than than a city, and the complexity and and the you know the the, the chaotic <laughs> nature of the cities is especially because they, they are you know uh, inhabited by by humans. So a, a couple of characteristics that we wanted to have uh, in this next generation of, of models. Uh, something very, very important is traceability of decisions. So if the model is deciding something or showing you any decision, any action, you, you know, need to have a way to trace that back to the agent that took that decision and why. Uh, the model being visual, I, I think that's again, something that uh, we struggled a lot with Urban Scene being text-based. Uh, so when I started working on this model, the first thing that I did was the UI and the mapping platform because I said we need to have this and, and be very, very clear. We also work a lot with accessibility uh, and mobility because uh, we think that it's uh, you know an attractor for for households to relocate and also for the real estate sector. So you know it's something very important to to take into account. Uh, it's also important to allow rapid iterations. Uh, Urban Sim took significant time to, to run. Uh, I mean, each scenario took significant time to, to try, and that prevented us to be able to experiment with many, many scenarios. In this application, uh, if you are studying a small study area, it will take seconds to simulate uh, the, you know, the, all the study area. So that allows you to create, you know, many scenarios and, and experiment with many different futures, given that we don't know the future as many futures and as we can uh, experiment probably will give you more, more insights. Um, it's also important to allow human intervention uh, because there, there are some models that are, you know, a change. Of, of different black boxes that are connected to each other and, and it's difficult to intervene on that. Um, and, and what is, I think, the main goal of all this is to discover emergent behaviors because, uh, you know, planners can look into a city, into a particular infrastructure project, but sometimes it's difficult to pick what Asian models can do. I mean, multiple, many, many, many Asians uh, interacting, competing for the land, you know, trying to, to do all that at, at once. So let me show you a short example of how um, scenario creating, creating works. This is an app zoning. So this is an area in Buenos Aires. What we do here is to draw a polygon. So we draw uh, a polygon over the existing zoning. We up zone that. So we change the height that is allowed. Um, then we run a simulation and you can see all the green buildings are the new buildings that will happen taking uh, advantage of that, uh, you know, that new height that is uh, allowed to allowed to grow. So let me change to, uh, I want to do some light demos. So I, I will change from the, on this screen 
and go here. Just one second. Okay. Uh, it's paused for some reason. I had okay, resume. Okay, thank you. Maybe stop sharing first and then share again. Yeah, share the whole so screen. That's this one. Uh, maybe share the whole screen so we can switch back and forth. Yeah, but now it's all the most so. okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I, I want to, uh, <laughs> I know that we don't have much time. I, I will try to reduce um, and to like five more minutes and then we can discuss because I think discussion and feedback is super important. But I, I want to introduce uh, what we do with accessibility calculations. Uh, that's, I think it's super important uh, in the dynamics of mobility and how we can connect mobility with land use. That's also one of my obsessions in the last time, uh, because in the past it was land use or traffic simulation, but, you know, I, I, and perhaps th there was like a waterfall uh, connection between them, like you simulate one year of land use, then one use of traffic simulation, then one, one, one. Um, that doesn't work really well in, in my experience. So uh, here you can see, for instance, let's see, accessibility to hospitals. In the application, what you can do is to uh, define modes and, and travel time for accessibility, just in case for the one that are not like familiar with the accessibility idea. So first, what we calculate is reachability. So we stay on a particular parcel of the city. We define a travel time. We define possible modes. In this case, we, we are looking into walking, but can be walking plus multimodal transit. And in that travel time, we see uh, how many parcels you can reach. Um, and, and we have here, you know, uh, visualization. Uh, I know if it is very clear uh, there on the screen, but each time I click on a particular parcel, you can see uh, all the parcels that are reachable, that are colored in, in red. So we first uh, compute that and allow the user to, to compute that for the different uh, travel times and, and modes. And then what we do is to, uh, given what is reachable from a particular parcel, we color the parcels according to how many of the point of interest can be reachable. In this case, this is a very simple case uh, that is good for explaining accessibility. We have uh, four different hospitals and these are the parcels that can access at least one of the, of, the, of the hospitals. We can do this also binary. That means the parcels that uh, either reach a hospital or as a rich hospital or with the case uh, to, you know, show you how, I mean, how many can, can, then, uh, can then reach. So even this, uh, I, I will show you Another example uh, that comes, that was Nyong, a city in Switzerland where we are working now, uh, mostly focusing on on sustainability issues like potential energy consumption and all that. This is uh, a very different uh, environment. This is uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And we are working there uh, with the ITDP and, and Institute for Transportation. We are... Um, working there to place affordable housing. Uh, traditionally, at least in South America, uh, affordable housing was kind of segregated, uh, placed in parts of the cities that were disconnected uh, with all the problems that we all know that that, that uh, generates. But the, the staff from the ITDP had a very good methodology uh, to place affordable housing, take into account a couple of, uh, I mean, it's a scoring system that is based on accessibility to all these different uh, amenities like bus stops, uh, health centers, early childhood. I mean, uh, many different, uh, ma many different um, accessibility metrics. Um, when you compute all of them, what you can do is to compute score. Uh, in this case, blue means better score that uh, indicates that are you know good spots for uh, placing placing affordable housing but you know that's basically 
things. So it has some uh, complexity on computing accessibility for a big area with different points of interest. But what is very important for us at Urban League is to be able to also create new projects. I mean, not, not only uh, taking into account what are the current conditions, but in this case, let's see, we can create uh, like a bike lane here. We confirm that. And if we we integrate into the scenario of the bike lane, you can consider that, you know, th there is a big change on accessibility if I turn off the, you know, so it, and the, the, the good part is that, you know, you can just draw different infrastructure projects, transit projects, and see how it will affect accessibility. And besides that, all different analysis that we do in the software are like, interconnected. So if we go back to the scoring, uh, scoring mechanism of the, of the application, when we introduce this new infrastructure, you will see now that, you know, the colors will change. So now it's, you know, it's much more blue. That means that the score is improving. So if there is a way or a part of the city that where you want to create affordable housing, even if it is not in the, the ones with a good score, you can also experiment with different infrastructure to see how, you know, cost effective could be your intervention in the, in the city. Um, to finalize, let me uh, show you two more examples. Uh, well, this is the expansion of, uh, of that area in, in Rio de Janeiro with an initial prototype for one uh, train station and it had very good results. So we are expanding that now to seven stations in, in Rio de Janeiro uh, to a you know, much bigger area. It's just for you to see uh, what are, you know, the capabilities on, on, in terms of visualization for, you know, this kind of, you can see uh, here, uh, it's uh, like a train corridor that goes like from here, the stations. We are in now accessibility to schools, all the black, you know, uh, markers are schools. And well, it, it is evident where the, you know, the, the, that there is bad accessibility to education. Um, so you can, uh, I, I don't know what is the population of this area uh, that we are taking that into account here, but it's uh, really, uh, it's like all this part of the city and then two different like islands in other stations that are uh, far that they wanted to, they wanted to see. Um, let me show you finally. It will be just one more minute and then we'll go to uh, discussion. Uh, I, I want to, sh you know, one simulation and its results because I was talking about, about accessibility, but not doing the, the real thing and, and simulating. So this is uh, what they wanted to do TOD planning here. So they want to densify, we configure our real estate uh, agents to join adjacent parcels and go from single family homes to multifamily homes. Uh, you know, try to do that in two scenarios. One scenario that uh, is uh, based on changing this, I mean, converting this parking space uh, that is around here, around the, you know, a transit, a train station into affordable multifamily home and without doing that. Um, you know, in a way to understand how the private investment will come and will, you know, support that initiative Mostly because this is, I don't know how many of you know Oakland, but this is like a low-income, very abandoned, somewhat abandoned part of the of the city because it's, it's near the port. So in any case, let's simulate uh, just to show you a couple of, of results. It will take, I think, around eight to 10 seconds. Okay, it's done. So as soon as it's finished, uh, something interesting that you can see below, it will appear now. So those are, all the new buildings that the simulation is uh, expecting to to happen, you can click on them and it will you know show you where's the building. It's just slow, but believe me that there is an animation that goes to <laughs> one place uh, and to, to the other. And you can see like these uh, blue buildings are the one that have been uh, constructed by the simulation. And again, trustability. You can hover on them and see the performa that was computed what was the investment result. And you can also see occupancy 
And again, if you want to look into like the black box or, or the internal model, you can see here all the events that happen in the simulation. So every time, I don't know, like an agent went to buy a particular multifamily building, what was the price that was paid because there, there are negotiations happening between the real estate sector and, and, the, and the families. Um, that's also, you know, very clear here. Uh, I think this particular graph is, is the most important one. Uh, each point there is a real estate transaction that happened. So those are the prices. So you can see what is the, the, the trend of, of the prices. And I don't have much time now to incorporate like, I don't know, any complex uh, intervention here, but let's say that we modify the inflation rates that is planned for the next year. We you know, come here again. We simulate and you will see now, okay, <laughs> that's, you know, all the prices will, will change, changing, taking that into account. That's all that I wanted to say, or perhaps I have a couple of more things, but given the technical difficulties, I have to compress a bit the conversation. So happy to receive questions now and feedback. That's super important. So everyone, feel free to raise your hand and ask the questions. And for people that are joining online, you can either type your questions uh, in the chat box or you can unmute yourself to ask the questions. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much um, for this great presentation and, and the great tools that I'm, I'm curious about your interaction with the stakeholders. You show that you can develop different scenarios and a lot of parameters that can be tuned. So how do you judge or how do you stakeholders well judge what is a good solution? What they should essentially should, should they go for, right? And, and uh, which decisions actually to take? Is there some kind of metric or how, how, how does the process work? Yeah, that, that depends a lot on the city. For big cities, it's totally different because for instance, for the behavior of the agents, we have open Python APIs and sometimes they you know go ahead and, and code some behaviors for themselves. So in that case, the model is more on their side in some way. For some of them, we do all the work and then perhaps they see a result that doesn't understand exactly. They, they don't understand exactly why it happened. And we, you know, understand the models, uh, show them the results, the data is based on. So there is, you know, some back and forth regarding that. Then there are situations like Rio de Janeiro, where we work with the ITDP and they have their methodology and we do the scoring. So in that case, it's easier because it's like we are applying, you know, a method from, from a, like a third party. Uh, but in the end, I, I think uh, what is important is the question that the city has, like the, the initial question that, that it has. For instance, in Buenos Aires, it was how, how, you know, how many soft loans we have to provide in a part of the city to bring the private investment uh, to that part of the city. Uh, and of course, there is no right answer because we don't do predictions, but perhaps, you know, a, a good answer is uh, simulating a couple of scenarios that look feasible uh, to them. Um, for instance, in that case, the, the, the answer from the model was there, there are a lot of urban barriers. So it was not about the soft loans. You can, you know, they, they were trying to, to, to understand the sensitivity of the soft loans to, a, to an outcome, but the model said, no, you can, you know, put a lot of money in, in, in soft loans, but if you don't solve these urban barriers that are around the place of the city that you want to develop, it won't happen. So again, we have to wait you know, a couple of years to see how that works. But again, I think the, the the success of these models is if it is helps someone in the city to think something differently, to understand, you know, a kind of dynamic that they were not taking into account. That, that is my success. But of course, you know, the success uh, depends a lot. Thank you. Oh, there is a question online from Christopher. Can you comment on the validation of this simulation? Well, it's very similar to, to, to what I, I was referring to. So mostly on the urban sim era, we did calibration and a lot of validation. Uh, but what, what mean validation at, at that point? What meant validation at that point? So basically meant going back 10 years, taking the data and simulating 10 years into the future. But 
for instance, if a pandemic happens in those 10 years and you use that for validation, what was, what's the point? And the same in the future. So it's like we don't have like a formal validation. What we try to validate is behavior. So behavior from the agents. That that it's very important. I mean, when you go to when we go to a new city, try to understand very well what is the behavior of families, what are the attractors, parts of the city for relocation of families, the same for real for the real estate sector. So we try to, you know, to validate with local knowledge that kind of behavior. It's not like we have a way to validate the more. Uh, I'm, I'm also taking into account for the one uh, doing the question that compared, for instance, to urban theme or other statistical model, this is more based on behavior. So the validation relates more more on the on the behavior. In the statistical models, yes, given that you are using statistics, you have to do that kind of calibration or, or yeah, model classic linear regression variation. But in this case, it's a bit different. Um, there is another question from um, Heiko from online. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Um, um, thank you very much for the really interesting talk. In fact, I see a lot of overlaps with um, the work that we do with our digital urban climate twin. And actually, I'm going to share some material with you afterwards, which was quite be interesting. But um, but I would like to know, actually, in terms of sort of who are actually the users of your um, application? Is it they, do you make these applications available to, let's say, the, the urban planners, for instance, and then they run their scenarios? Or do you sort of translate whatever the kind of ideas they have and then you use this tool to find answers or the, um, yeah, basically the results to these scenarios? So, so how does this usually work? Yeah, again, uh, it depends on the city. Uh, I would say that with Urban Scheme, there was a lot of involvement for, from us uh, because it was very difficult to use. So they, they need a lot of support. Uh, right now, uh, for the big cities, we just install the, the, the software and they you know, can experiment and, and we do training and, and answer support uh, you know, questions. Uh, probably that's, that's enough. For the smaller cities that think they don't have you know, perhaps they have a planner that does some GIS, but uh, doesn't have a lot of knowledge on, on in models uh, itself. At least uh, the first year of subscription, it it involves uh, a lot of hand holding, and then uh, our idea is to make this application as autonomous as, as possible. For that reason, we implemented all these Python open APIs and and. All, all the possibilities uh, that are to to change the behavior of the model and and also export data. So we want this to to be one more tool in in a, you know for for planners uh, in general. But but yeah, it, it depends on the on the city and 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 all the options that you mentioned uh, are are possible and and have happened. Thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned um, having to uh, kind of uh, represent regulations in all the contexts you, you go into and having done that for Singapore, that you made a regulatory search engine, I know how much time that is. Um, when you do that, do, do you follow a, a kind of... Um, workflow in order to define that? Are there parts that you can reuse? Uh, because in our case, we, we're making ontologies. Um, and one of the things we're interested in is going to other cities, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. So what's the workflow there? Yeah, and, and yeah, I have to say, <laughs> we work a lot on zoning and, and, and regulations. And yeah, we have been trying for years now uh, to find ways to improve that process. It's a challenge. It's it's really difficult. Uh, at least what we try to do is to more or less have a standard format to be able to then compare different jurisdictions and to standardize that for the model to consume that. I mean, with a base uh, model and then have additional fields. We also started at some point uh, a project called Open Zoning, uh, where we try to do a kind of open street map for Sony. So mm -hmm. creating like a standard, you know, data format and allowing users to allow data. That project is still there. So we are trying also to, you know, contact mostly with universities because 
many times they do like they, they gather some regulations for you know different uh, uh, work class uh, cl classroom work and, and that kind of things and and it's good to take advantage of that but I have to say that no I, I don't have any you know precise or, or rule of course we have our workflow but it depends a lot on the city uh, some cities even for instance in the US that I, I worked a lot uh, they have PDFs and you have to digitalize the PDF so that's the starting point some other cities uh, that, that is different the only I think that we need more, I would say, sophisticated for this is to create the domain language to, in a way, to express the most complex zoning regulations because there, there are some values that are what we say in computer science, we say scalar parameters. So it's just a number, it's an integer or floating point number. But there are some of them that depends on the geometry of a nearby building. So we started to build a kind of domain language where you can, you know, language similar to Python, you can, you know, code that kind of things. Um, that's good for us because then when you have to visualize them, if you only have to visualize numbers, that's easy. We know how to visualize numbers, but when you have to visualize like the building envelope, but that building envelope includes a lot of geometry operations. We have like a, an engine that can, you know, parse uh, that, that language and then generate the geometry, like the build out of, of the building from that language. It's not something you know, complete or, you know, uh, it's like a work in progress. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 that, the data gathering parts, uh, given that UPF and read the law, it's like many of the research projects that are on, on, you know, how to translate law into logic, into computational logic. And it's, uh, you know, it's open, open research. What we try to do is at least when we store the data, you know, try to, to store that not only as scalar and numbers and attributes, but also try to, to store that logic in this yeah. domain language. That's the only thing that, but in any case, I would love to know uh, more about what you are working on. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good your uh, administration interested in adapting cities to climate change? Uh, the question is about adapting cities. Or... Uh, yeah, yeah. So ah. in your experience, uh, ah. administration. Yes, uh, our project in in Nyon, uh, in Switzerland, is all about climate change. Uh, we are studying their solar potential. We are studying their energy consumption and how retrofitting will affect the future of the city and also the heat island. Uh, we are allowing the city to plant like virtual trees and, and then see in, in, in a few years how that will affect shade and, and the temperature. We are doing that uh, in connection uh, with, the, with the model from ETH, the city energy analyst. We are connecting that software to our, to, to our software because I mean, city energy analyst is very good to, to analyze the current conditions or I mean, to, to plug it into any data sets that can be current conditions, for instance. But what we do, you know, is to, to see the future of the city. So what we are, are doing with CEA is to connect with to current conditions and to different scenarios in different futures. So in that way, uh, you can understand how different planning scenarios uh, will end up affecting the, you know, sustainability issues. So. So yes, that's something new to us because we have been working more on the US, more the real estate market and, and real estate sector and, and, and looking more into housing and prices. But now that we are starting to work more in, in Europe, uh, yes, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's very interesting for us to, to work on this. Hi, um, so as we mentioned earlier, we've offered this expectation of this management comes to simulation prior to the potential deeper to expect and for the physical bottom. And experts like yourself who understand all the caveats that come with like simulations and new models and decision making. Um, was this mismatch a challenge in working with um, stakeholders when you release some of these projects? And um, how do you communicate the limitations of the technology with them? It's something I think. Uh, all of us in the lab think about the same thing in the quantification team. And I really the question is, is it possible to consciously define tools in ways that allow people to be um, more productive in the models, like UI or like all these ways um, to promote a more like healthy relationship with the model, or is it all about like the training and the software structure? 
it's a yeah, super interesting question because uh, when you go to publication things, you you know uh, see very very different situations, and um, and of course the application to adapt <laughs> to to that and 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 yeah, it's really difficult. About like the one click thing, I I try to you know basically to confront the that app approach, uh, showing them you know examples and and. How you know models went wrong uh, in the past? <laughs> they used that uh, approach into account, um, and then something else that I think is important for for these models is uh, any model, in some sense, is a composition of different algorithms or, or different models, but have ways to run them separately to understand what exactly is you know each of the model doing, and then at some point you can. Uh, you know, concatenating them, uh, look them, and, and have like a regional workflow. But it's very important to understand, like, step by step, what what is, what is happening. And um, something else that is very helpful is to work on smaller scales. Uh, for instance, in regional model, it's much more difficult to understand the trends and and why the growth is happening in, in particular places. Um, but when when you start working in these smaller areas, and you can see, okay, if I plant it in here. I see what is the temperature now and what will be the temperature in five years. You know, it's much more easy to connect like your inputs to, to the outputs. Uh, so I, I think that granularity is very, very important uh, over on that uh, up to a point. Because then, then of course, we will have training. Uh, we also love to do training and to you know, uh, inform the cities about models and the limitations and what is prediction and what is forecasting and uh, what can be used for. So, yes, and about the second question about you know, UI and, and what to do to, to improve the stability of this softwares. Uh, I have to say that uh, perhaps it is strange, but uh, low latency is super important and allowing collaboration. Uh, you know, one might say that is no, like, uh, I don't know, online help or, or, I don't know, using like super sophisticated UX techniques. But I think uh, if there is low latency in anything that you do, like running a model or computing accessibility or like you draw a pipeline and you see, you know, instantly what happens. And that allows you, you know, to, uh, have that feedback very fast and, and, and experiment a lot. I don't know, it's like when, when we also talk about collaboration. I love how collaboration works in, in Google Docs because you are, you know, all the time seeing who, who is on what. And, and, you know, it's not like you have to like commit something and, you know, wait. And it's like it's happening like in real time. And I think there is a lot of value when, when it's possible to, to have low latency. And that is, Somewhat un un unexpected for me, but from my experience, it it's super important. Um, maybe you could take one last question, and for the rest of the question, we continue uh, after the talk or do yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, so behavior, I mean, any patient based model, so your, your main entities are the, the agents, uh, and, and of course, you have the current conditions, the data, and the agents are there, but what they do uh, is it's super important. It will take, of course, a long time to explain uh, all the behavior that we have called, uh, even the standard version of the uh, of these agents. What, what I can you know, tell you is that our main agents they have, have to do with offer and demand in the city, so the real estate sector and households. For the households, we you know characterize them by the different family types because we take into account uh, a lot of accessibility and accessibility bias a lot depending on the type of family, the you know the, the income, the you know, many characteristics of the of the family. Um, and how to like to 
and understand or measure the quality, how that meets the, the, the real world. Uh, it's something that it's validated or not. Uh, we you know work, work with the particular because as soon as you click on simulate in 10 seconds, you can you know see what was the, the behavior of those agents in the conditions that you are you are uh, finding. And, and, and again, I think that low latency is the best way to validate anything because it's like uh, you don't have to do a lot of theoretical discussion. It's like you know press that button, wait those ten seconds, see you know what it was the the paper of that family why uh, they chose to relocate in particular part of the city. You can you know see this black box of the model. You, you can understand why that happened. And again, then you change the scenarios or some conditions because uh, you think that that will change the system and you click, you know, simulate 10 seconds and then you can see how that changes. So I think the best way to, to be if behavior is right or not is to like to make uh, those agents face very different conditions and, and see how they react to those conditions because in the end, behavior is a reaction to the particular. Uh, a particular incentive in that case. And this, with real estate, the developers, we try to, to interview a lot of developers for the city in the projects that we, we have time for, for doing that. And, and again, understand very different behaviors. In that, that part, it's literally more difficult because a lot of intuition is involved in, in the real estate uh, sector. And it depends. Much more on infrastructure, so it's sometimes it's more difficult to, to validate. But again, you define a paper for the real estate sector, some construction codes, and kind of performance. Ten seconds, you see where they are building, and if you don't understand why or you don't agree with what the simulation is doing, you can you know all the time like take the the, the Python DI. I, I want an indicator. I want the real estate sector to value this particular indicator. So if you, you know, take that indicator from the API, you know, make that value to the real estate agents, and they will take that into the account. So I would say that it's, you know, mostly uh, an interactive process. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jose, for coming to the Global Seminar Series. Apologies for the technical issues.